Hi everyone, I am Edson and I'll be uh, the moderator for this afternoon's press conference. We have two guests who will be presenting uh, survey findings from a recent study done by the Center for Information Integrity and the Internet here at the Wikimedia School of Communication and Information. So I'll, without further ado, I'll turn over uh, to our first guest, Dr. Tang Hao Go, and later Dr. Benjamin Lee will present uh, findings from the survey. Dr. Go. Hello everyone. Hi, uh, thanks for joining us today. So um, today we are going to present to you um, the findings from wave two of our longitudinal survey. So uh, this, this is the second time that we are actually um, surveying a same group of participants. So, okay, let me proceed. Okay, uh, so before, before I begin um, sharing the survey findings, maybe I can share to you about Incube. So in Incube, uh, Incube is a new research center found um, last year in early January. So, so what we do is um, basically uh, internet research, things that are related to media consumption, privacy, misinformation. Yep. So uh, Incube has a interdisciplinary team. So um, we have with us uh, not only people from WikiMV school, but also from other schools as well, like social science, uh, business school, college of engineering, and RSIS. Yeah. Okay, so our research team is quite diverse. Um, we not only look at uh, media consumption, but we also look at fake news, uh, trust, accountability, emerging technologies, and digital well being also. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we have actually contributed to not only public discourses, but also to academic research. So um, every month we actually hold webinars and we also contributed regularly to commentaries. Yeah, so uh, if you have any questions or, or if, uh, if you are seeking for any kind of collaborations, uh, please feel free to actually email us. So, um, okay, without further ado, let me get into our survey findings. So like I say, um, this is a longitudinal survey. We are in the wave two of our longitudinal survey. So um, for this wave, we have actually collected 800 respondents, 800 responses. So out of these 800 responses, 689 of them are actually recontacted. So in other words, they actually did our survey again. So the data collection period um, is actually from 15 July to 5th of August and the average age of the participants is actually around 42 years old. So as you can see, most of the respondents here are actually Singaporean and they're Chinese, and we have roughly an equal ratio of male and female. Yep. So, um, so th this is a general information about our survey participants. So, um, so I'll let um, Benji, uh, uh, Professor Benji to, to actually uh, share with you findings for uh, video conferencing fatigue. Thanks, Zhang Hao, for the introduction to Incube and then to the survey. Um, just a brief um, overview of why it's important in our opinion to understand the um, landscape with regards to Singaporeans' perspective and experience of video conference fatigue. Um, is that over the past year and a half, because of um, COVID-19, um, that companies and schools are, across the world are imposing um, work from home arrangements and also home-based learning arrangements. Um, so because of that, um, while that has allowed for workers and students to still carry on their studies um, and their work, um, there have been increasing reports of people feeling tired and exhausted and burnout out um, from video conference use. Um, and to our knowledge and understanding, there hasn't been an um, empirical or, or, or kind of like a study or insights into how Singaporeans experience video conference fatigue. So because of that, um, in Incube, they decided to conduct a study um, to understand um, people's uh, experience of video conference fatigue. All right, so, so, so the first thing that we wanted to find out was how many hours 
do Singaporeans spend on video conferencing? And from our results, we found that on average, Singaporeans spend about three and a half hours a day on video conferencing. And if you look at the chart, right, in terms of percentages, so you see like 43.7, that's percentage of our respondents that indicate one hour that they spend on video conferencing uh, and two, three, four, and so on and so forth. Um, you see the majority of them, although um, they spend roughly about one or two hours a day, um, but there's an increasing amount or more like a worrying percentage of respondents, roughly about 20% that spend about six or seven hours, um, uh, six hours or more on video conferencing. And in terms of looking at the effects of excessive screen time on things like eye strain um, and behavioral effects, that's something uh, which is doesn't look too good. So um, about average about three and a half hours a day, so um, that is what we are getting from our respondents. Um, next thing is that when we try to draw relationships between work from home arrangements and the video conferencing hours that they spend, what we see is that the more days that they spend working from home, it has a significant correlation with the number of hours that they spend video conferencing and also the number of video conference meetings that they participate in, which is an interesting finding because in most of our understanding, when we talk about people spending time at home, working from home, we imagine them just working on their own task, uh, working on Excel spreadsheets if they are in, in finance, um, working on Word documents. But this element, this social element of communicating and of having meetings with others online is something that doesn't exactly, the, not the first thing that comes to our mind. So to see this positive correlation between the days that they spend at home and also the hours that they spend and number of video conferencing meetings that they participate in shows us that there is like an intrinsic relationship when they are spending more time at home working, it also inevitably leads to longer durations that they spend uh, on such platforms. Another thing we found was that when we, when we analyzed the frequency and the length of video conferencing meetings, um, on average, our respondents indicate that they um, take part in two video conference meetings a day. Um, and you can see that the bulk, right, the bulk of the number of uh, uh, video conference meetings that they conduct is between one to three. That's where that's where the, the bulk of their meetings are. Um, and in terms of the duration of the meetings, um, 52, almost 53% of our respondents indicate that they spend between 30 minutes to one hour for each video conference uh, session. Um, and that there's also a significant number in terms of like this 15.9% of our respondents that indicate that their video conference meetings can actually go up longer than an hour. Um, and there's been research that we know that shows that the um, longer the meeting lengths are, it creates more strain on you, whether it's in terms of physical or, 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 or mental stress. Uh, so that's something which we uh, which you note uh, not exactly very healthy. In terms of the tools, the video conferencing tools that our participants use, um, almost 51% of them say that they use Zoom um, as the most popular um, uh, video conferencing tool of choice, um, followed by Microsoft Teams and Skype and Google Hangouts Meet, uh, which is not a surprise to us because if you're talking about the different platforms that companies have um, adapted to um, ever since um, COVID broke out. Uh, Zoom is a popular choice among most companies because of how easy it is for people to jump in uh, and the user interface is smooth and easy to use. Um, and as compared to the previous wave of a survey that was conducted by InQ, the popularity ranking is still the same as before. But in terms of the percentage of Zoom users uh, or using of Zoom, we, we saw a 10% increase as compared to the previous study. So this just goes to show 
that in terms of popularity of uh, video conferencing platforms, that Zoom is getting more popular even uh, now, one year uh, after our previous survey. Okay, the next section, we will look at the different aspects or what we call the dimensions of video conference fatigue um, and how our respondents answered the questions that we posed them. First aspect of video conference fatigue is what we call the physical dimension um, of fatigue. And this includes the aspects of like bodily pain, neck ache, shoulder ache, and pain in the wrist. And for bodily pain, the, we, we saw almost 50% of our respondents who experienced at least moderate fatigue, meaning to say that it answered three and above uh, with regards to um, the uh, to the extent that they feel bodily pain after video conferencing. And you see it's pretty consistent across the board when it comes to these four different dimensions of, uh, of physical fatigue, um, where it's 47% uh, for the first three and 43% for the last one. Um, so you see that generally it seems that Singaporeans who engage in video conferencing experience at least moderate fatigue uh, in their, uh, uh, physically. The next aspect of video conference fatigue we were interested in is in terms of the emotional stress that they feel after engaging in video conferencing. And as you can see here from the chart, 45% of our respondents felt at least moderate stress um, when it comes to the emotional stress that they feel after video conferencing. Um, so that was something which uh, was a concern to us that in terms of understanding the impact uh, and prevalence of video conference fatigue, at least in the physical and the emotional aspects, there seems to be some um, relation there in terms of how our Singaporeans are feeling it. The other aspect of video conference fatigue relates to the occupational dimension. And in this dimension, we were interested to find out about how productive they feel after video conferencing. Um, whether it affected their energy levels or they had some self-doubt um, to meet the work demands. And we see here that if you look at the results here in the graph, that 50% of our respondents felt at least moderate fatigue in terms of um, their energy levels to meet work demands and also their self-doubt self in their ability to meet work demands. So it affected quite a fair number of our respondents in this area. And the last aspect of video conference fatigue we were interested in is in terms of the conflict that people might feel at home um, as a result of spending increasing time from work from home arrangements. Um, as you know, you know, when we are home more, um, there can be different time and strain demands that's being placed on us because of the presence of our family members. Um, it could be because of the children that's home due to their own um, home-based learning arrangements or just due to increased tensions and conflict between uh, what the employers want from the employees and at the same time demands from family. And what we're seeing here is that it's like almost um, 45%, um, some yeah, for like 43.5, 42%, all have some moderate agreement um, to these statements that measure this conflict that they feel at home due to these work from home arrangements. So for example, like you see the first question, which asks them, I'm often so emotionally drained after completing my work from home duties that it prevents me from contributing to my family. And you see it's consistent across the board um, that because of this tension between their work duties and what they um, have at home, that this causes to some extent um, a moderate level of fatigue among our respondents. So after we have identified or explored um, 
how the prevalence of these different dimensions of video conference fatigue among our respondents, we attempted to draw relations between the length of time that is spent video conferencing um, to predict these different dimensions. And what we found was that there, there were significant positive correlations between the hours spent on video conferencing and all four aspects or dimensions of video conference fatigue, whether is it in terms of physical, emotional, occupational, or family, um, that we found that there were moderate relations and significant relations between hours and these aspects. And what we can conclude from this is that individuals who spend longer hours on video conferencing, they are more likely to experience video conference fatigue. And we further analyze the relationships among these four dimensions. And what we found was that there was a significant positive correlation among all the four aspects of um, video conference fatigue. You will see that some of them have pretty strong relations. Um, for example, between bodily pain and stress is like a 0.8. Bodily pain and work-related issues is like 0 0.8 to 0 0.81. Um, and while, yeah, so what this kind of uh, uh, suggests to us is that if you tend to suffer or if you suffer from one aspect of video conference fatigue, you are also likely to suffer from the other aspects of fatigue because it seems like they all come in a package together. Next, we will explore the causes of video conference fatigue among our respondents. So based on past research, um, we have already identified what are some potential causes or determinants of video conference fatigue. And based on this past research, we came up with questions to measure our respondents' perception um, of these different causes. So the first cause which we identified was the social pressure to be constantly available. And in these figures here, this refer to the percentage of our participants who either agree or strongly agree with these statements. Um, the first statement being, sometimes I don't want to be contacted to video conferencing. Second one being, I feel pressured that I have to be available on video conferencing. And the last statement being, I'm pressured to respond quickly to all video conferencing requests. And you can see here that the figures were like 60% and more than 50%. And this suggests that to some extent, um, our participants feel the pressure to be constantly available. This social pressure um, that is on them, which is a potential uh, cause of video conference fatigue. The next cause of video conference fatigue that we were interested in is in terms of the cognitive load from processing information. Um, that one of the things is that when we are in video conference meetings, there's a lot of information that we have to process in terms of number of faces that we are seeing, in terms of the um, speech cues that's coming in. Um, some people could be texting in the chat, chat box. So we wanted to see does this cognitive load also exist among our respondents? And the three statements that we measure this aspect are, I am often distracted by the excessive amount of information in video conferencing. I find that I am overwhelmed by the amount of information that I process, and I feel difficulty in synthesizing the information in video conferences. And you see that for these three statements, um, they are either close to 60% or more than 40% in terms of how our participants agreed um, or strongly agree with these statements. So that also suggests that for our participants, they feel to some extent um, excessive cognitive load from processing information in video conferencing. And the last aspect we were interested in, in terms of the antecedents of video conferencing, um, uh, refers to the communication load, overload that participants might feel. And the three statements that measure this are, I I've, I've often feel overloaded with communication from video conferencing. I feel like I have to attend more 
video conference meetings than I would like to, and I receive too many video conferencing requests. Um, and so you can see for these numbers here that our participants also to some extent feel that there is a certain level of communication overload when they are engaging in video conference meetings. So what we found when we drew correlations is that the time spent on video conferencing, it generally has a significant positive correlation to these causes. And the inference that we can draw from this is that when we spend more time on platforms like Zoom or Microsoft Teams, it leads to an information overload and a communication overload, which might overwhelm our respondents and, um, uh, and in, in, essentially cause them to feel certain aspects of video conference fatigue. And for the last aspect, we were looking at what are certain ways that we can relieve video conference fatigue based on past suggestions and advice and past research. Uh, we had identified a few um, potential solutions to alleviate video conference fatigue. Um, and we asked our respondents to rate how often um, they use these different measures when they are video conferencing. And the first one statement that we asked them is how often do you use the mute button? Second one being how often do you turn off your webcam or hide your video screen? And the third one being how often do you take breaks in between video conference meetings? So you can see here that these are the three different solutions that have been proposed to reduce the amount of video conference fatigue that individuals uh, can experience. And you see that for the first two, um, they generally are, um, it's more than 40%, almost 50%. So our participants do, uh, to some extent, use these certain measures to reduce uh, um, the fatigue that they feel. Um, and for taking breaks, they, it's, it's kind of less percentage. Um, but my, my guess is that that's usually because uh, it is at the whim and fancy of the employers. So if the employers allow them or say, okay, let's take a break and then they're able to. But if most of the times the employers are the ones who kind of determine whether the meetings carry on from one to another, then our uh, respondents probably don't have much say in having a break. <laughs>